For the first time ever, an AI system outscored all human contenders at the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament in April 2021. While AI systems have beaten expert human players at other games like chess or Jeopardy, the best humans have always taken down each artificial crossword puzzle solver they've come across. Building an AI system that is both fast and accurate enough to outperform human experts was only possible after fusing traditional approaches to artificial intelligence with modern techniques from natural language processing. AI talks crosswords in this first episode of a series that guides humans through a world where computers talk. An American crossword puzzle is a grid of squares together with a set of written clues. Each clue corresponds to a left to right or up and down stretch of blank squares that must be filled with the answers to the clues, one letter per square. The clue answers interlock so that each square is part of the answer for two different clues. In the New York Times crossword puzzle from April 23rd, 2021, clues range from trivia and factoids such as 37 down, first and only president of the Republic of Hawaii, through oblique descriptions like 43 across, father figure, where the answer is priest. To unexpected word senses, the clue for 62 across, log, doesn't reference cut timber, but record keeping. The answer is enter. And on to outright wordplay. 25 down, it's measured in both feet and meters. A poem. While it takes me 30 minutes or so to answer maybe half the clues in an easier New York Times crossword puzzle, the best human finalists completed the championship puzzle of the American crossword puzzle tournament in three minutes. Meanwhile, our new crossword AI overlord, who goes by the name of Dr. Phil, completed perfectly this same championship puzzle in just 49 seconds. Matthew Ginsberg, a former professor from Oxford and Stanford, constructed Dr. Phil over the past 10 years. Ginsberg's AI creation attains its crossword puzzle prowess by using a tried and true approach to artificial intelligence called objective optimization. There are three components to the objective optimization framework. First, we need a computational model of the real underlying problem. This computational model needs to mirror the underlying problem. So, for example, if we solve the computational model, then we will also solve the original problem. A useful computational model also needs free parameters. Free parameters are variables or settings that the person building the AI can modify to bring the model into closer alignment with the underlying problem. We'll represent the idea of a computational model with a physical model, this simple stretch of marble track. Our marble model has a single free parameter, the horizontal position of the marble. Once we have a computational model for our problem, the second component of the objective optimization framework is an objective function. An objective function consumes an instance of the computational model with all free parameters in the model nailed down to specific values and outputs a single number that represents the goodness or accuracy of the model at the current settings of its free parameters. In the marble track analogy, the objective function that we will optimize is the height of the marble. We want the height to be as low as possible, so if the marble is on the left of the track, the marble will be higher, and the objective function will output a worse score than if the marble is on the right. The third and final component of the objective optimization framework is a search algorithm a procedure or process for adjusting the model's free parameters so that the objective function will output an improved goodness score. The search algorithm that will improve the height objective in our marble track 
is gravity. Gravity will roll the marble along the track to the right, and as it does so, the marble's height will decrease, optimizing our model. The art and brilliance of AI lies in first devising a computational model and objective function that describes a real problem, and then creating clever search algorithms that can identify the parameter settings that will optimize the objective. Matthew Ginsberg's team executes the steps of the objective optimization framework beautifully, twice over, in the design of Dr. Phil. Ginsberg attacks crossword puzzles by dividing the larger task into two subproblems. First, the AI system identifies multiple candidate answers, or fills, for each individual clue, assigning to each candidate answer a probability estimate. For example, given the clue five letters for log, Dr. Phil might propose the following set of candidates. Trunk, with a probability of 0.4. Enter, with probability 0.25, stump at 0.2 probability, and diary, with a probability of 0.15. Each of these five-letter words is a plausible fill for 62 across, and while the AI believes some of the candidates are more likely than others, if we add up their probabilities, we get a value of 1. The second subproblem Dr. Phil must solve is how to interlace the possible fills for each separate clue into a full solution to the entire puzzle. In our example, while trunk has a higher probability of being the correct fill in isolation, its letters conflict with the correct fills for the intersecting clues, such as 49 down, like the walls of an old church maybe, where the answer is ivied. Although the interlacing of answers happens after the AI has proposed candidate fills for each clue, the algorithm for completing full puzzles was developed first. So we'll start there and come back to answering individual clues in a moment. To apply the objective optimization framework to the interlacing of candidate answers, Ginsberg needs a computational model of a crossword puzzle, an objective function over that model, and a search strategy that can adjust the parameters of the model to optimize the objective. Ginsberg's computational model of a complete crossword puzzle is simply a direct representation of the crossword grid but inside the computer's memory. Meanwhile, the free parameters of this model are the characters that fill each individual square. As Dr. Phil adjusts the characters, the AI will bring the proposed solution into better alignment with the actual solution to the puzzle. The natural objective function for a crossword puzzle is the joint probability of a complete fill of the entire puzzle, given the clues for that puzzle. Unfortunately, there is no effective search strategy that will optimize the probability of a complete puzzle fill. First of all, Dr. Phil has no way to directly measure the probability of a complete fill. The AI only has estimates of the probabilities of fills for individual clues, not entire puzzles. And even if there was a way to measure the full puzzle's fill probability, the number of possible complete fills is so large that there is no effective way to find the best full puzzle fill. To get out of this quandary, Ginsberg simplified Dr. Phil's objective function. Ginsberg assumes that all clues' answers are independent of one another, that the answer to one clue has no influence on the probability of a particular fill for any other second clue. This independence assumption obviously isn't perfect. Answers that intersect are clearly dependent on one another, but even when two fills don't intersect, answers may still not be independent. In this puzzle, the clues for 13 down and 64 across are intentionally similar, and so their fills, teen and SRTA, the Spanish abbreviation for senorita, a young unmarried woman, are related. 
But for the majority of non-intersecting fills, Ginsburg's independence assumption is reasonable. The probability that 12 down is ogre likely has nothing to do with the fill fiber in the opposite corner of the board. Pun noted. In statistics, if two events are independent, then their joint probability is equal to the product of their individual probabilities. So, in our case, Ginsburg assumes that the probability of a particular setting for all the fills of a puzzle, given all of its clues, are equal to the probability of the first fill, given the first clue, times the probability of the second fill, given the second clue, times the probability of the third fill, given its clue, multiplied all the way down through the probability of the final fill for the final clue. In return for using an objective function that is only slightly worse at modeling the likelihood of a complete fill for a crossword puzzle, Ginsburg gains both an objective that is computable and an effective search strategy that correctly completes crossword puzzles. In fact, Dr. Phil's search strategy is specifically designed to patch the holes in the objective function's independence assumption. The search technique that Dr. Phil uses to interleave the answers for a crossword puzzle is similar to what a human might use. Or at least it's similar to the way I try to complete crossword puzzles. When faced with a new crossword puzzle, I read clues one after another until I find one that is clear and unambiguous. I then proudly fill in that word. Each individual answer that I can pencil in places constraints on the possible fills for crossing clues. And these constraints, when I'm lucky, lead me to an unambiguous fill for a clue that I wasn't able to answer on my first pass. Dr. Phil searches for answers the same way. The AI sequentially identifies the clue that it finds least ambiguous, writes in that fill, and then proceeds on to the next clue, whose answer is newly least ambiguous, given the constraints that the previously answered clue placed on the puzzle. Here, it's worth noting that since Dr. Phil never considers incompatible fills for crossing clues, Ginsburg has already patched one hole in his objective function's independence assumption. Since Dr. Phil looks for unambiguous clues, we need a definition of ambiguity. Ginsburg defines the ambiguity of a clue as the difference between a goodness score for the highest scoring proposed answer to the clue and the goodness score of the second best proposal. If there is a wide gap between the score for the topmost fill and that for the second best, then that best fill is unambiguous. Since we already have estimates for the probability that individual fills are correct, we could directly use those probability estimates as the individual fills goodness scores. But Ginsburg thought up something a bit more clever. Ginsburg's complete goodness score looks ahead at how filling one clue will affect the set of possible fills on the rest of the board. Going into the details of Dr. Phil's goodness score would drag this already lengthy episode out a bit too far, but if you'd like a full explanation of Dr. Phil's goodness metric, head on over to my Patreon page where patrons can view a version of this episode that goes into the gory details. But for now, it's enough to know that Dr. Phil calculates a goodness score for each fill of each clue, and that Dr. Phil answers clues in order of least ambiguity with respect to this goodness score. Greedily completing a crossword by sequentially proposing the top fill for the least ambiguous clue is unlikely to lead to the correct solution to a crossword puzzle. And, since our computational model mirrors the real underlying puzzle, the greedy fill is also unlikely to be the one that optimizes our objective function, the product of individual fill probabilities. Dr. Phil needs a backtracking strategy, a way to undo proposed fills that turn out to be wrong so that another path can be explored that might lead to a better value for the objective function. The problem with backtracking in a crossword puzzle 
is that because the total number of possible different fills for a puzzle is so large, if allowed to proceed unbounded, backtracking will never stop, and so to both permit and control backtracking in his AI, Ginsberg uses a technique called limited discrepancy search. On the first iteration of limited discrepancy search, Dr. Phil finds the complete greedy puzzle fill that involves no backtracking, and then calculates the product of the probability of each clue's fill, the objective function, in that greedy solution. On the second iteration of limited discrepancy search, Dr. Phil finds all complete puzzle fills where, in at most one location, the AI uses the second least ambiguous fill instead of the least ambiguous. If any of these not quite greedy complete fills has a better value for the objective function, then that new complete fill becomes the solution to beat. And the process continues. Dr. Phil stops its limited discrepancy search when increasing the number of permitted backtracking steps by one does not produce a complete puzzle fill that improves the objective function. Once limited discrepancy search ends, the AI moves into a final post-processing phase. In post-processing, Dr. Phil corrects for the assumption that fills are independent by searching for patterns among the fills. The AI also attempts to improve the objective function by replacing single individual fills with alternative answers. Unfortunately, in my research for this episode, I was able to find very few specific details about this phase of Dr. Phil's search. If anyone knows more details, I'd love to discuss them with you in the comments below. Matthew Ginsberg built and incrementally improved Dr. Phil over the past 10 years, but it is only this year, in 2021, that his AI was able to outscore all the human participants at the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. So, what changed? In 2011, Ginsberg published a paper in the Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research that describes an early version of Dr. Phil. One paragraph from this paper captures Ginsberg's original design philosophy in a telling manner. We designed Dr. Phil so that it could truly exploit the power of its underlying search algorithm. In constructing the list of candidate fills for each clue, for example, we don't require that the correct solution for a clue be the specific fill for which the probability is maximized, but only hope that the correct fill be vaguely near the top of the list. The intention is that the hard constraints corresponding to the requirement that the filling words mesh do the work for us. As with so many other automated game players, we will rely on search to replace understanding. In other words, Ginsberg largely ignored the language aspect of crosswords and instead approached them the same way that others had approached games like chess as a search problem. Treating crossword puzzles like just another game that could be solved with search was not entirely unreasonable. For the past 10 years, Dr. Phil has solved crossword puzzles on par with the top 100 or so best human solvers in the world, but ignoring the language aspect of crosswords does leave information on the table. While in chess, there is no hidden, unobserved meaning behind a certain layout of the pieces. A pawn on the e4 square is a pawn on the e4 square. End of story. In a crossword, the clue scrubland danger carries a lot more meaning than merely the sequence of characters S, C, R, U, B, or even the individual words scrubland and danger. Think of all the times in your life you use the word danger. Now erase all of those memories from your mind, you would feel blind. This is the way Dr. Phil has been competing in crossword tournaments for the past 10 years. Blind and unknowledgeable. This year, Ginsberg decided it was time to up Dr. Phil's understanding of language. 
So Ginsburg joined forces with a team from Berkeley led by Dan Klein that has expertise in modern techniques from natural language processing. Prior to 2021, Dr. Phil used a set of simple but reasonable heuristics to create and assign probabilities to each clue's individual fills. For example, if a clue in a new puzzle had occurred in a database of previously seen crossword puzzles, or if a new clue shared a word or phrase with a clue already in that database, then the answer to that previously seen clue was suggested as a candidate fill in the new puzzle, with a high probability. In contrast, the Berkeley team's approach to proposing fills for crossword clues is based on work done in open domain question answering, a currently flourishing area of natural language processing. In open domain question answering, an AI system must answer factoid questions on any topic. Where is the world's largest ice sheet located today? Or, how many episodes in season two Breaking Bad? The technique from open domain question answering that Dan Klein's team adapts to crossword puzzles is called dense passage retrieval. This technique was first proposed in 2020 by a team from Facebook, led by Vladimir Karpukin and Barlas Ouz. A human who answers open-ended factoid questions or crossword puzzle clues has knowledge about the real world. But hand compiling this knowledge into a database format that a computer can use is extremely time consuming. So state-of-the-art approaches to question answering instead use large collections of unstructured text, such as Wikipedia, as their knowledge sources. Most question answering systems, including the dense passage retrieval system, extract answers from their text collections in a two-step process. First, an AI system searches for passages of text that are likely to contain the answer to the question. The question answering system's second step is to identify a short span of words in one of the selected passages as the final answer. Just as Ginsburg used the objective optimization framework to interleave candidate fills into a full solution to a crossword puzzle, Karpukin and Ouz use this same framework in their dense passage retrieval system to answer individual questions. But while the underlying framework is the same, the specific computational model, objective function, and search strategy are very different. In fact, it is remarkable that this same framework can accommodate such different approaches to two very different problems. Let's focus on the first subproblem of open domain question answering, passage selection. The computational model that Karpukin and Oz use to select passages takes the form of a pair of functions. For the moment, we'll ignore the internals of these functions and just focus on what goes into the functions and what comes out. The inputs are pieces of text. One function consumes the text of the question, while the other consumes a passage of text that may or may not contain an answer to the question. The two functions process their textual inputs and each outputs a list or vector of numbers. While a list of numbers may not seem like much, vectors hide a world of power. Vectors of three numbers can represent any point in the three-dimensional physical space we live in. And similarly, the vectors that the question and passage functions output will represent points in an abstract high-dimensional space. We'll represent each output vector as an arrow with its tail at the origin and its head at some particular point in the output space. So what are these two functions that process text and output vectors? They are a special type of neural network called a BERT transformer. This episode of AI Talks is not a tutorial on neural networks, let alone on the inner workings of transformer networks or BERT for that matter. For anyone interested, 
I've added links to tutorials explaining BERT transformer networks below. Uh, here, all that matters is that BERT is a mathematical model with many free parameters that is very good at converting sequences of words into useful vectors of numbers. Okay, so now that they have a computational model, Karpukin and Ous need an objective function for dense passage retrieval that can lead their algorithm toward passages containing the answer to any question. Consider the BERT question network for a moment. After churning on the words of a question, the question network outputs a question vector, an arrow that points in some abstract direction. The goal will be to convince the passage network to output a vector that points in the same direction as the question vector exactly when it is fed a passage of text that contains an answer to the question. And whenever a passage does not contain an answer to the question, the passage network should output a vector that points away from the question vector. And so Karpukin and Ous build their objective function around a measure of the similarity between the vectors that are output by the question and passage networks. Specifically, dense passage retrieval measures the similarity between two vectors as their dot product. The dot product is negative when two vectors point in opposite directions, zero when they are at right angles, and at its maximum positive value when two vectors point in exactly the same direction. And since our objective is to output aligned vectors only when a passage contains the answer to a question, the final objective function that we maximize is the probability that a passage containing the answer produces a vector that is similar to the question vector. The last component of the objective optimization framework is a search algorithm. Neural networks are a well understood class of computational model and have standard search algorithms to optimize objective functions. The most common search algorithm is called stochastic gradient descent, which literally means go downhill. The free parameters in a neural network are variables that can be set to any real number. The gradient descent algorithm considers each free parameter and calculates whether the objective function will improve if that parameter is increased or if instead it will improve if the parameter is decreased. Once the algorithm knows which direction each parameter should be adjusted, gradient descent takes a small step in that direction, moving downhill to a better value of the objective function. In our case, moving the settings of the BERT network's parameters downhill, such that the question and passage networks produce vectors that are aligned exactly when the passage contains an answer to the question. Four times out of five, and against a variety of question answering datasets, dense passage retrieval will place a piece of text that contains the answer to the question among the 20 best scoring passages. This is a significant improvement over the previous state-of-the-art technique, which would only identify a passage containing the answer about 60% of the time. To extract the final answer to each question from out of the retrieved passages, Karpukin and Ous again use a BERT neural network that is fine-tuned with gradient descent, but this time the objective function seeks to identify the beginning and the end of the answer phrase. End-to-end -end dense passage retrieval correctly answers factoid questions better than 40% of the time, which might not seem that great, but is significantly better than methods from just a year ago, which correctly answered only a third of questions. As of recording this episode, I could find no detailed information about how Dan Klein's Berkeley team adapted dense passage retrieval to propose answers to crossword puzzle clues instead of answers to open domain factoid questions, and my outreach emails went unanswered, but I imagine that Klein's team followed the broad recipe for dense passage retrieval that Karpukin and Ous outline simply using sets of crossword puzzle clues and answers to fine-tune the various BERT neural networks in place of the open-ended questions and answers used in the original implementation. If and when Klein and Ginsberg publish more details about their joint work on Dr. Phil, 
I'll link their papers below. But what we do know is that the full combined crossword solver built twice over on the objective optimization framework works remarkably well. By first using dense passage retrieval to identify candidate clues, and then applying Ginsburg's sophisticated search techniques to complete full puzzles, Dr. Phil bested all comers at the 2021 American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. Congratulations to Matthew Ginsburg, Dan Klein, and everyone who contributed to this impressive feat of language understanding. Thanks for watching this first episode of AI Talks. I started this channel to provide in-depth explanations of modern approaches to natural language processing. If you enjoyed this content, please let me know by liking this video, subscribing to the channel, or becoming a patron on Patreon, where we can chat about AI and language processing on a dedicated Discord server. I'll see you in the future, when AI talks.